Good afternoon and welcome to Video Cinema Media and Technology. New technologies are increasingly present in different fields such as health sector, industry, energy and the economy itself, but also in the audiovisual and film sectors. Digital transformation is changing and accelerating creative processes and has a direct impact on different areas of our industry. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, blockchain and cybersecurity are some of these technologies. We will talk about all of them and much more in this two-day event. This two-day event can be followed on site or via streaming. We welcome those of you who are here and those of you who are following us from the other side of the screen. We have speakers from different backgrounds, so presentations will be in Basque, Spanish or English. For those who need it, we have set up a translation system for those of you in the room. And have, we have also created language channels on the Tabacalera streaming platform. This year's edition will feature seven presentations. At the end of each presentation, we will leave time for questions. And in the case of uh, streaming, we have set up a chat so that you can send us your questions for the speakers. So now he's repeating in Spanish because he was talking Basque before. Good afternoon. Welcome to Video Cinema. I was saying that new technologies are increasingly present in different fields, such as health sector, industrial sector, and the energy sector and the economy itself. But also the audiovisual, uh, audiovisual and film sectors. A digital transformation is changing and accelerating creative processes and also, for example, content consumption. In this event, we will talk about technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, virtual uh, reality, blockchain, cybersecurity, and many more. And presentations will be in Basque, Spanish, or English. For those who need it, we have set up a translation system here in the room. And for those of us, of, of you following us through uh, streaming, we also have set up different uh, language channels that you can choose. At the end of each presentation, we will leave time for questions. And for those of you following us via streaming, uh, we have set up a chat so that you can send us your questions for the speakers. This event is the result of a collaboration between uh, the Bideo labora Laboratory managed by Tabacalera and the Film Festival. Both institutions would like to welcome you to the event. We invite Edurne Ormacer Zabal, General Director of Tabacalera, and Jose Manuel Arias, Spokesperson of Cinemaldia. You have the floor. Good afternoon. Be welcome. We are now going to start with this uh, video event. And it's a audiovisual content lab in Basque language in collaboration with San Sebastian Film Festival. We are talking about digital transformation, new technologies and the impact they have in the audiovisual sector the impact they have had in the past, they have now and they will have. We see this impact as an opportunity in video. And our goal is to deepen in this uh, field. We want this uh, to be a meeting point for as, uh, experts in technology, in different technologies, for creators and for professionals of the audiovisual sector to improve uh, know-how together and to deepen in the needs of the sector. Because uh, I'm sure that many innovative solutions can be suggested, both for creation, production, post-production and distribution for all this audiovisual digital content. I'm sure that over uh, this afternoon and tomorrow, we will learn a lot from each other. This is all I wanted to say. I hope you will enjoy the event. Jose, you have the floor. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much for being here. I don't have much more to add. In name of the San Sebastian Film Festival, I'd like to thank Tabacalera for this uh, cooperation. Uh, we're 
festival uh, has a wonderful ally in Tabacalera. Uh, for instance, I, we've done Zabanteri, Tabacalera Inés, and other programs like Icusmira and Sidmelmania 70. Since 2018, we work together organizing Cinema Dian Technology, where we reflect during the festival on the audiovisual connections with technology. And of course, we could not only think about how technology is changing the audiovisuals during the festival, and we wanted to work also with uh, video, this uh, laboratory in Tabacalera, to present these conferences that are part of uh, this uh, project that lasts a whole year of the festival. In the last months, we've worked together to set up uh, the, a series of uh, conferences and dialogues between the agents that making, are making uh, possible the integration of these technologies in audiovisuals. Like Anait was saying, we're going to talk about security, about how uh, this applies in the film sector, stop motion, blockchain, and the constant reinvention of the production processes in audiovisuals. Again, we would like to thank you for being here today. Thanks to everyone watching us from their homes, and thanks to Tabacalera for this cooperation that we hope will last for a long time. Thank you very much, Edurne and Jose. We are now uh, going with the first talk today, cybersecurity in the audiovisual field, how technology can help us to work and consume content safely. Maria Pinilla is the technical director of SIUR Foundation. SIUR is the Industrial Cybersecurity Center of Guipúzcoa, and its objective is to reinforce and develop the cybersecurity capabilities of companies in our territory and strengthen their competitiveness. And on the other hand, we have Iñaki Regidor. He is the systems director of AEUTB uh, Media. And he will talk about uh, these TV channels uh, experience in the field of cybersecurity. How can technology help us work and consume content safely? Thank you, Maria and Iñaki. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to everyone watching via streaming. Thanks to Video and Tabacalera for giving us the opportunity to be here today and share our knowledge concerning cybersecurity and technology. As Anait was saying, SIUR is a foundation that depends uh, draws from the uh, Diputación of Guipúzcoa. Our sector is an industry, but our experience and daily uh, work is not so much as a typical company in the industry. So we are very glad to be here, but your sector is not the one we usually work with. So we've uh, carried out a documentation task so that we can share with you the experience we have in the technological world and getting to know what you do in your daily life. And we've tried to adapt it and uh, tailor it to you. So we hope it will be useful. We're going to carry out a short analysis of some cyber attacks in the audiovisual world because we think you will uh, identify yourselves more with that. We will analyze what happened during those cyber attacks to draw conclusions and learn some lessons. We will give you some quick tips on how 
we in CEOR think that cybersecurity should be managed in a company, and I'll let you know about some new technologies in your sector that we think will be useful to improve your security. Now, let's move on to the first example. Some of these attacks may be known by you already, of course. This one took place in December 2015. Six years ago, there was a massive leak of a lot of uh, films, documentation, and audiovisual content on many Hollywood films. And back in the time, they were even managers, CEOs from some of these companies saying, of course, it uh, impacted some specific films, but it was a threat for the whole industry. The cyber attack uh, took place during the uh, work uh, that's done before the screen, the pre-screening, so that uh, critics can see them before. And that's how they managed to access all this information. And that's how they did this massive leak. I wanted to highlight the supply chain in this case, because we don't, you shouldn't only worry about having good cybersecurity measures, but the supply chain, our providers are also part of the game. And we must also make sure that our suppliers also have the necessary safety measures and they need to respect some protocols because if they are impacted, even if everything is very well done on my side, I will be impacted in the end. And that was the case. Another example, this one is in from May 2017, and it's very similar to the previous one. Disney uh, had access to, someone had access to a Disney film. At the beginning, nobody knew which film it was, but uh, finally it was known that it was Star Wars The Last Jedi. And this is a copy of uh, the email they sent to Disney, saying that unless they received two bitcoins a day, which back then was uh, about 4,500 euros, they would make the film public. And you know, uh, the impact of having such a film leaked before it is released. It's much more than these two bitcoins, of course. And they got the content also after, through a post-production company in Disney. So our security plan must also be implant, implemented by our suppliers and of course they must be able to prove that and finally another example of some of the most known cyber attacks this is the last one I found it took place this year in March so this is quite recent and the title here says that it was the biggest hack that's ever taken place in the film industry. They hacked salaries of uh, CEOs uh, of the audiovisual industry, of the government. So the damage was not only on the content, but also on that side as well. 
And as you can read here, in now, so far, this is the biggest cyber attack of the history, but cybersecurity is here to stay. It's becoming increasingly important. And soon, we will have an attack that's bigger even than this one. This is a trend that we have been witnessing from the foundation, and that will keep increasing. So cybersecurity must be part of our daily work life. I will now look into more detail this cyber attack that probably many of you know. But because of how it happened, I think it's interesting to have a look at it with you. It is supposed to be the first cyber attack that happened in your sector. And I wanted to ask you if you dare say when you think it took place. Well, when the when if you know when Toy Story was released, you may know. But what year in what year did this did this happen? Do you dare tell me? Would you make a guess? It was 1998, 23 years ago. And I think this is an interesting data because uh, some of us have been working for years now in cybersecurity. Well, maybe I'm younger than my colleagues, but sometimes people tend to think that cybersecurity is absolutely new, that this will go away soon. And the truth is we've been living with it for years now. And many of us in the sector have been working for years on cybersecurity, adapting to the new trends, to the new attacks. And like I said, this is here to stay. How did this cyber attack take place? Well, there were 150 people working on the animation of this film. And as far as I know, for Pixar, all its workers were equal, and they all had total access to everything. So they decided that the 150 people had were granted total access permits to all the animation data. Besides, they had one single backup copy. So in 1990, you might think now that this was something usual in 1990, but as you can imagine, nowadays having one single backup copy would be crazy and that can lead to a serious problem. So that's the background. And something happened, of course. One of the 150 workers executed a command that uh, means delete everything in my computer, which is quite usual. But since the 150 workers had access granted, that deleted all the safety, all the uh, backup of the animation film. So it was chaos. One of the animators realized that he, he was he, when he looked for one piece of his work, um, he couldn't find it. It prompted an error. And they had to start from scratch again. And I'm sure you'll know better than me how much that can cost, how much money I mean. But it had a happy ending. They were lucky. There was one person from the animation team that was pregnant, and when she gave birth, she wanted to work from home. And each week, she received at home one copy of the animation so that she could work locally at home. And when someone realized that, they run to her home. And fortunately, she was still working locally. They recovered the animation copy, and they only lost two weeks' worth of work. So like I said, it was a happy ending, but it could have been a drama. I chose this case because you might think that this is not really a cyber attack. 
There was no hacker with uh, hood in a dark room stealing data. But from our point of view, from the cybersecurity point of view, this is considered as a cyber attack. In our risk analysis, we must take into account that many times things like that happen. So problems don't only come from the outside. Trouble sometimes is inside, uh, sometimes unintentionally, unintentionally, of course, but sometimes it could even be intentional. And this is something that we must take into account in our protocols. So what are our lessons, the lessons learned from these cases? which apply to your sector. Like I said, I don't know very well the film industry, but I mean, not only due to these COVID pandemic times, but there's a clear trend to telework. It started during the pandemic, but I'm sure it will go on in the future. In any case, I think in your sector, you have many people working from their homes, from an airport, from a hotel, from a coffee, people all over the world. And all these people is accessing your animation, your content, your data. So from cybersecurity, it's a complicated environment to manage because it's always easier when all the workers are working together in one single building. So I do believe you must be especially careful with authentication. The fact that many workers can access from their uh, laptop, from the mobile phone to critical information requires an extra effort to make sure that the authentication is well done. So that uh, if I access from my phone, you must be sure that it's really me Maria Pinilla accessing, no, not someone that has replaced me. Cybersecurity is here and it will stay. And yes, it can be a nuisance sometimes. We are constantly annoying you with, uh, with our recommendations, but it's going to be increasingly necessary. And I believe your sector is very attractive for the bodies because if I can attack Disney, for instance, because I know they're going to publish a new film and I get the copy one month earlier and I ask for a ransom, uh, I will probably succeed to get the money I want. So, of course, behind this, there is a financial motivation. Like I said, your sector is attractive for these people. And the way to fight it is to have every user in every email, in every file they receive, in every single thing they do, to have cybersecurity in their hands and to have it in all your processes. Um, today, we will also talk about artificial intelligence, blockchains, drones. But all these technologies work with data. Data are the common element for all of them. So you need to make a, spe a special effort to protect data since they are created until they are deleted. In all those, in all your projects, you must include cybersecurity. And like I was saying before, we are used to be a nuisance for companies because a cybersecurity manager, what I want is to have a good level of security in a company. And in front of me, I have a user that wants to have uh, things quickly, easily, and everything I suggest is uncomfortable. It means that you have to do a double logging, and it takes time, and they cannot send things over the email because it's not safe enough. So like I said, it's not comfortable. So we need to find a middle point where the security level 
is good enough as a security manager and easy enough for users because if it's too complicated for them, they will certainly find another way to do it. It's probably not safe. So we need to find a balance between security and ease of use for users because users have to be creating movies and animation. So like I said, balance. Things are not always black or white. We can sometimes work in gray shades. And I also wanted to say that, um, well, I think this is clear. But behind all these attacks, there is a financial motivation. Hackers work in companies with uh, a pressure to obtain easy and fast money. So, like I also said before, your sector is very attractive for them because they know they have chances to get this profitability by attacking you instead of other companies. I'm sorry to say it, but that's reality. In the cybersecurity strategy that we really encourage you to carry out, we always recommend companies to first take a picture Take a picture to know where you are. Carry out an analysis of all your assets, all your important assets, and do an analysis to see what the risk is for each of them, depending of how critical they are for you. And once you define your policies and your cybersecurity measures, then you decide what's more critical so you can allocate more resources to that. I wanted to insist on this because if you don't see something, it's impossible to protect it. If you don't know what your critical asset, asset is, it's very difficult to protect it. Now, once you have this initial picture of where you are, then you need to know where you want to go and how much I need to invest. And in this gap from where I am and where I want to get, that's where you decide your investments. And when we talk about investments, we shouldn't talk about expenses. We, if, because even internally, it makes it difficult to realize that it's necessary to invest on that. We like to say that cybersecurity is an investment, and we think it's a competitive value for you. I know that sometimes you need to convince people that it's necessary to invest on that. But so it should be. The entry vector in most of the attacks we see is the user, because usually they are the weakest barrier. We have the phishing, we have uh, the email. And I'm sure that many of you in your work or personal uh, email, you have received a phishing email of someone who says he's someone he's not, uh, where you have a link to a malware. And that user vector is uh, very handy for them. So the only way is to um, have a lifelong training for the users, uh, continuous training for, for them, for all the users. Because sometimes when we see what users have done, we say, but how could he do that? But the truth is we don't teach them, we don't uh, give them the necessary tools to make the right decision and realize that this is a dangerous email that they're receiving. So in our foundation, we really insist that it's necessary to invest on training and how to manage uh, security actions. Well, of course, you need to think, when will I be attacked? Um, will my infrastructure be effective? Well, that's good, but that's not enough. Will I be attacked? Yes, you will. Sooner or later, you will, because this is what happens in all companies nowadays. So if we manage our cybersecurity thinking of, of how, uh, when will the attack take place, well, then we will, you will be ready, you will have a response plan, and the recovery of your network and your services, which will be much quicker than if you've never defined it before. 
because if you don't, then users won't know what to do, and that will be chaos for your company. Well, I'm not going to read all the details here. You will have the presentations later, probably. Um, in our foundations, we have found different technologies. In point number four, Iñaki will talk more about this, but you can see that uh, these are things that can be very useful in your sector, and you can use it in your daily work. So we think this can be very useful for your daily cybersecurity management. We will leave it here for you so that you can read it later. That's all from me. And I hand the floor to Iñaki now. Thank you, Maria. Well, so what can I tell you? Maria has already shared with you a framework, a reference framework, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You have already heard the news. Now let me tell you the truth. Well, that is a Spanish journalist who says that. My name is Iñaki Regidor. I am the CEO at EITB since 1999. I don't know if you can see my presentation. It seems to be frozen there. And well, I used to buy Pixar for my kids. Well, I knew about that case, but this thing about cyber attacks or cyber security, we should put things into context. And the context is that this is a war. This is the fourth world war. We today put in and Biden are meeting together, as you all know. They are in Geneva, and they are struggling. They are fighting each other. The CIA, FBI, they are fighting against each other with the Russian army. This is a war, so we cannot forget about it. So we are just, you know, normal people, and we are collateral damage. But those collateral damages they live within a framework. And the good piece of news is that, unfortunately, we have had to learn how to live together with all that. What am I talking about? COVID-19. We have learned how to live with it. So are there any similarities between COVID-19 and cybersecurity? Yes, because we are already speaking about vaccine, mass social distancing, uh, hand washing, screening, trackers, and all that. So if we move forward and if we go beyond, there we see the bodies, even if they don't wear a hood just like that one. No, they wear a suit and a tie every day, and they get wealthier and wealthier. We have vaccines, yes, it is true. EDR and others, Panda, McAfee, Kaspersky, Sophos. We also have local firewalls in our PCs. Most of us, we have Windows or uh, Macintosh. But is it activated? Then activate it. That is the first thing to do. That is something healthy to do. But we also have fire, firewalls such as Checkpoint or Palo Alto or Fortinet. Many of these come from Israeli and from Israeli experts. Israel is the state which suffers less attacks, and they have a cybersecurity division in their army since the 1990s. So we need segmentation of networks. Well, that is how we have been creating little bubbles, the bubble with which um, people in the financial world work are not the same one as creative people. We need to segment things. And that can be done very easily, that segmentation of networks. And uh, something that we all should be doing is to switch off PC every day. If I carry out a survey, I am sure that 50% of you, you never switch it off your PC. 
So we have to switch it off every day. I know that then it takes time, but that is how things will be updated. The new antivirus signatures will be updated. We need to switch it off. In EITV, it is compulsory every day. Every single PC, user PC, has to be switched off every day. And every day, it is true that they think of me and they are not very happy workers, but I think that is the only method. We also need patches every day, safety patches every day. We have to use them. That is very important too, even if that takes place. We also need to have network access control. There you have different brands so as to know what is happening in the network. It is just as if the Minister for Infrastructures did not know how many vans or how many buses are going through our highways. We need to know about all that so that we can act. We need to have an SIEMM, an events correlator. This is happening here, that is happening there. Mm, this looks distinct. This could be an attack, and we need to have tools. In EITV, we compile some 80 gigabytes per day. I am talking about information coming from different systems. We need to correlate all that to put it together so that we can know what's going on. Then we also need to have an SOC. Sometimes it will be easy or not. I'm talking about expert monitoring. And also, of course, awareness raising is essential. Edurne Armazabal, you know, she was getting my emails every week because I wanted to alert everybody. Awareness raising is essential for all of us. And then we need training. We people, we need to be trained. And mainly those who are providing the technical support. Training, yes, just as if they were hackers. They need to become hackers. They need to know how to hack. If you know how to hack, you know how to protect yourself. All these different measures, if we go back, they look so similar, right, compared to COVID-19. So this is the good piece of news. The framework is already there. We know about it. And Marian spoke about it before. It is not realistic to wonder whether we will be whether we will be attacked or not. We have been attacked and we were not conscious. The truth is that we are all going to be attacked. And it is true that uh, you may think that we at EITB are protected. No, that is not true. Just like any other company in the world, every day, every single day, there are cyber attacks. Sometimes they will succeed, and some days they won't be able to succeed. But we need to protect ourselves, and we need to know about those measures. And now let's go to a horror movie. And now you will be saying, everybody is attacked. Yes, if you have not been attacked, just wait, because you will be attacked too. According to INCIBE, which is a foundation, a Spanish foundation working in cybersecurity, 76% of Spanish companies have had a cyber incident in the last six months, and the other 34% will they just have not realized. It's just as clear as that. That other 24%, they just didn't know about it. And those, the cybersecurity experts, they should know that the risk is there since the year 2004. Well, and then, of course, you will be able to take a look at all this in detail. Here you can see all the different companies that have been attacked. Sony, 78 million users leaked. You know, there has been a huge leak of information. Of course, information is what they want. Data is the 21st century oil. Have you got users' data, users' information? That's what they want. JP Morgan, as you can imagine, or eBay. Maybe our information was there, Dropbox. Do you use Dropbox just as easy as that, as happy as that? Don't use Dropbox. It is It's very, very dangerous. Dropbox, Dropbox has not a virus control whatsoever. So 
you are left completely naked. Please do not use Dropbox. It is as clear as that, and you use it every day. Well, this is just a comment. I am not going to be talking about Ash Ashley Madison. Well, you know, Facebook, of course, you know what has happened, British Airways, Ticketmaster, etc., etc. Just last week, a cyber attack in public health system in the UK, in the United Kingdom. Those are the consequences. And I leave all that information there for you to read it. It's very scary. It's true, it's scary, but that is the reality. And that goes from city councils. Well, for example, the oil pipelines in the United States, the good thing is that they were asking for bitcoins. But that was stopped by the FBI. The hacker was stopped. But these things are happening every day. So is there such a thing as absolute security? The answer is, of course, no. Is it possible to be 100% protected? Well, we can't get closer to that percentage, as Maria was saying. And Maria said, emails, navigation, portable devices. Those are the easiest devices for them to get through. So that is why we need to pay attention. Switch the PC off every day. Be careful with links, with things we download. It's true that zero. Trust, yes, we should not be trusting nothing, anything, nobody. Can I trust Antonio de Coa as a CEO for EATV? No, no, I cannot trust you. But he is your, he is the head. Well, just as if he was appointed by the Pope. No, zero trust. We cannot even trust the Pope. And now, let me take you somewhere where I think you all are already, which is work security, work safety. That is something we have regulations, rules, but of course, security, safety, health measures, at work are essential. If not, our company will close down. So in this case, what is the risk I have? If I change, for example, this grid here, somebody, for example, could fall, well, I have to measure and I have to adopt different measures. So in cybersecurity, which is the risk for somebody hacking my website? I have to measure to assess the risk and then the measures are there. So we just have to implement them. We know how to make it happen. And this is uh, something that Lourdes Iscar said. This is the Work Security Department. The cost of non-prevention is much higher. That is what this lady said. We have had this year 14 or 15 workers losing their life, being dead, because there were not the right measures. In Germany, there was also, you know, in deaths provoked by cybersecurity, but the scenario, the framework is already there. So let's just act in the same way. And in the year 2015, the annual cost of cyber incidents was two trillions. That is huge. I don't know how many zeros are there. A lot of money. So then we say, well, it is true that here we only learn when our neighbor has suffered something. Yes, that is already happening. We are surrounded by that. Take the hint. What about the telephone? Who is not using a telephone, a phone, mobile phone, fixed phone, ADSL, router? We all know what happened with WannaCry and what happened to Telefonica. And the person who was in charge back then, he was the guru, he was God. Well, since then, we do not hear about him. Yes, that Chema, that guy, you know, with those locks, 
it seems as if we all had to look like him. No, we get dressed like we get dressed. And they had a huge problem in Telefonica, even if they had that expert. And, you know, many different workers had to be sent home. Some of them had to be made redundant. Another example, in November 2019, LACER, that is a radio station, they had to go back to cassette players because they were cyber attacked. Cassette players, some of you, I'm sure that you have never seen a cassette player. They could not even use their CD readers. And they were saying, come on, keep on talking, keep on talking, because they could not, they were not able to reach their recordings. And that was something that affected the whole country in Spain with this radio station. It has taken them six months to go back to normality. And as you can imagine, in terms of ad advertising, that has generated huge losses. And that is huge. That has had a huge economic impact for them. As if, for example, Santurci, Santurci, that is the city where I come from, and there have been many different cases there. And it is true that the cybersecurity expert you know, it was a nightmare in the city council, in that town hall, they had to start from the very beginning, from scratch, because they were attacked and all the pieces had to, you know, they, it is as if they had been destroyed. Different cases in EITB. As Maria was saying, in the supply chain, our the company with which we work was encrypted. The server, where all the proposals, the offers, the campaigns, accountancy, payrolls. And why did that happen? Because within their supply chain, they had a computer service which had access via remote uh, laptop to certain laptops in the organization. What happened? They did not switch the pieces off at night. Then a hacker, a hacker was able to go into that PC. He saw that there were six connected, 16 others were not connected, and they were encrypted. And then he said, well, the server is here. So they encrypted it too. As, uh, as Maria was saying, suddenly there was somebody who had some files on Gmail. It has taken them six months to go back to normal, and that happens within our supply chain. Different cases in EITB, yes, we had a ransomware for the graphics department. Three programs which were already ready with all the graphics, suddenly they collapsed. Why? Because somebody came with an external hard disk and he just switched it on. And that's it. It was as easy as that. So he had access to the segmentation and that's only affected one part, one server, one graphic server, the CIO scam. The financial director gets an email from Mikel Aguirre from the economics department who is sitting next door and one says to the other, listen, Javi, we need to pay this invoice. We need to pay this. We are talking about 200,000 euros. And he says, listen, Miguel, have you sent this to me? But what are you talking about? How should I or how could I send that to you? Aguirre, well, you know, everything seemed normal, as if it was true, as if that person had sent the email. But of course, it was not true. So we decided to record the conversation, and then we went to the police, to the Artanta. And then they there was a telephone number from London. The police was able to record all that. They were giving plenty of details. 
And that is what we did. We called the police. So as soon as you have a cyber incident, call the police. Call the police, the Archanta or whoever. Call the police because they will be helping you. They are going to help you because they are experts. And that's the only thing to do. And I have one further case. And it is that on Friday, they also tried to, yes, to, to ask him. There was an email, one of our suppliers say, listen, we have changed our bank account. So please pay not on this account, but on this other account. Everything looked perfectly normal. We asked them through the email for the certificate, for the ownership certificate, and they sent it. So that is what the protocol said. But today we need to ask from a certificate from the bank. And they were able to send that bank certificate. And there was an ING account. And those days, that account had been getting a lot of money. And they said, oh, that's very strange. They said, at ING, and that is why they found it weird. And they closed the bank account. So the attacks are there all over every day, and we just have to pay attention. So this is my final message. This is a governance question, risks and fulfillment. If we are able, governance, risk and compliance, that is what we have to do. If we are able to do all that and to manage all those different things, we need a strategic plan, a safety plan. There are different ISOs that can be helpful. You do not need to have all the fantastic uh, certification 27001, but certifications are there, and that is very useful because we need to know how to manage risks, risk management. And then we have different regulations in Spain, general rules for data protection, cyber security. Once again, we are talking about uh, data information, people. All that is there. And then how do we implement all that? We are within the show business or in the audiovisual sector. And I love opera and Figaro, of course, who is the main character. And Figaro starts by singing Cabatina Fatotum La Chita in the Barber of Seville. So that is how we are living, like Figaro. He's singing in Italian. I am here, I am up here, I am down here. That's how we all are. But that is the situation. This is the situation, but once again, within a framework, within a framework that we cannot neglect that we all need to know about. And there are different things that can be helpful. Yes, Maria has already been speaking about that. We have the Basque Cyber Security Center in the Basque Country, which is closely linked. Well, it is. it belongs to the government. They are in close contact and in relationship with the police. But we need to comply with the national scheme so then we have the CCN you know spies C and I that is what they are they are spies well let me tell you an anecdote when we wanted to enroll to one of these services they give you a probe so as to analyze your traffic to see if there are bodies there then in the Ministry of Defense that comes from the signature from the minister and this person, the regional minister, told me spies are going to come to us. Yes, why not? It is a bit scary because we are talking about spies and about the CNI. Why not having spies there? But some of them, they are just good people. Well, that's what I wanted to share with you. That is the URL. It is true that they have apps, they have documents, they know 
about how to correctly configure the firewall, the antivirus. They know about all that. They are experts. And it is true that we pay taxes and we pay that. So I think that is a great interorganizational initiative, one of the best in Spain in these last years. So that's what I wanted to tell you. If you have questions, then of course, do not hesitate. Thank you. Hi, Caldera, en Bateo, Valdima, Agua. ¿Alguna pregunta? Any questions? Well, I think we don't have questions in the chat, but I wanted to ask you, especially you, Maria, you've been talking about different industries. What does the audiovisual industry have to learn from all the industries where you work? Well, I think I said it before. There are certain sectors and industries that started working on cybersecurity years ago. Like I said before, I'm not an expert, but from what I've seen so far, I think in your sector you still have many things to do. You're probably one of the last sectors that uh, got on board as far as cybersecurity is concerned. So, of course, you can have a look at what other industries have done and follow their example. Like I said, there's no silver bullet, but many things are already invented. And knowing about uh, good practices and good experiences from other industries can be very useful for you. And I'm sure you can implement many of those measures and make the most of their own experience. Because even if you think that a manufacturing sector is very different from the audiovisual sector, when you really look into detail the processes, finally, the needs are the same, the investments are the same, the users are the same, and the difference is not so big. So there are more common points than you would think, and you could really benefit from other sectors' experience. Like I said, in other sectors, we've been working on that for many years, and we know that there's an important know-how. When in 1999, I started to get acquainted with the EITB content uh, manufacturer, I told them, well, this is a little bit like a salami manufacturer. And they were all looking at me with big eyes. And I said, well, yes, because uh, you get your raw material, and then you do your product, and you sell it. It's the same. It's exactly the same. You have a raw idea, you adapt it, you treat it, and you have your product, which are um, entertainment, uh, TV shows, whatever. But in the audiovisual sector, we must realize that we are not so different. The management framework is exactly the same. We all have our balance at the end of the year. We all do an industrial risk management or at least we should, financial risk management. Yes, of course. So it's not so different. But of course, it's easier to simply close your piece and say, well, tomorrow it will start again. Yes, um, here we have companies from the audiovisual sector. And we were saying, how can you serve them, how can they access an entity such as SIUR from their sector? Well, we are an NGO, a public entity, and our aim is to help the industries to improve their cybersecurity. We do lots of awareness raising talks so that you realize that it is necessary to take that into account. We want to help you train your users. We think it's crucial. We collaborate with you and with other companies. There are, uh, we publish sessions in our foundation where we tackle different uh, awareness raising topics because we think there's a lot to do in that field. And we also get together with companies that we serve because we think it's important to sit down and carry out an analysis to see what your data, critical data are, 
to realize what the value of your company is, of your business. And we help many companies do that and say, well, how many servers you have? How many users? Where are your data? Are they encrypted? Are they in the, are they in the cloud? Because you're in the cloud, they can forget about it. That's safe. No, no, sorry, no. So we start helping them think and we help them take this initial picture so that they can see what are the next steps they should take. Like I say, we are a public foundation and we cannot compete with other companies in the sector, but we just want them to make that first step. That's what they help them with. That's what we help them with. Yes, and then there's the SPRI. SPRI from the Basque government. So. The previous cybersecurity analysis are, I think, are there at 40 percent, but the measures to implement are part of another program that's also funded by them. So there are important aids, financial aids by SPRI to finance that. Yes, and the Guipúzcoa Diputación Guipúzcoa as well for Basque companies, of course but they do help them financially to implement that kind of projects. And yes, there are, we must say that there are quite many and um, quite good uh, cybersecurity companies in the Basque country. Panda was born in Durango next to Bilbao. Um, and there are companies with a good product, with relevant services and first range actors. World class actors. I should say. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Maria and Iñaki. It's been a great pleasure to have you here. Very well. So we must move from uh, a very important topic to a very important, another very important one. We know jumping from cyber security to artificial intelligence, the secret ingredient. That's the title of the next presentation. Sami Arpa is a founder of Largo Company who won a, uh, the uh, Startup Challenge in uh, 2019. Sherpa won't be uh, present. All the way from Switzerland, we welcome Sami Apa, founder and CEO of Largo AI. It's not the first time that Largo AI is with us here in San Sebastian, as Largo AI was the winner of, this, of the start, Startup Challenge of the San Sebastian Film Festival in 2019. In this presentation, Largo, uh, Sami Arpa from Largo AI will question the, the, the influence and benefits of the use of artificial intelligence in the audiovisual sector. So, hello, Sami, and welcome to Cinema, uh, Video Cinemaldi and Technology. I can see you on the screen. Can you hear us properly? Hear you. What about you? Hi, hi, Sami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, great. Yeah, so, uh, Sami, so thank you very much for being um, with us here today. We're very much looking forward to, to, your, to your presentation. As we did in the previous, previous presentation, at, at the end of, of your masterclass, we'll have like a, a quick window for uh, questions and answers. So um, yeah, thanks again. Uh, th thanks a lot once again uh, for being with us, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. First of all, for invitation, it's really great uh, to be a part of uh, the Namaldi again uh, two years later. And today I will shortly talk about uh, our progress, and then I will give you uh, a case study example. Uh, from a movie that has been analyzed on our uh, system. So we have Largo AI platform, which is a SaaS platform. You can access this just through through your, your web browsers. And with this platform, you can uh, analyze movie scripts or rough cut, fine cut video version of the films. And the system provides uh, story insights, uh, market potential of the film, casting propositions uh, for producers, distributors, uh, financiers, and screenwriters. And you can analyze a film at different stages, uh, at pre-production, post-production, or uh, distribution stages. 
we already have a good uh, traction in the market. We work with many uh, big players and, and then a lot of independent producers that is uh, a part of our vision as well to open these systems also independent uh, production. Okay, now I want to talk shortly about uh, a bit history of the usage of AI in the film industry. Uh, one big step uh, for this is recommendation systems. And then uh, Netflix started to use strongly uh, recommendation systems in 2006, uh, 2007, which was followed by Amazon. Uh, and at that part, they were trying to understand uh, audience by using uh, machine learning techniques to show the right film to the right, right audience. But the concept has been changed a bit in the next decade because, uh, I mean, the players, they started to think instead of uh, proposing ready-made films, why not ordering the right film from the scratch? So that was also the time of the, this original content, Netflix originals, uh, for example. Uh, and this brought a big advantage uh, because before you were just limited with what uh, studios, producers has produced. But at that part, by using again the power of uh, data and AI, they could know in advance which film will work for audience and then you can order uh, the right film uh, very much in advance. But this created already a big uh, disruption in the industry. And I think we will see its impact uh, more stronger way in, uh, in the current decade. We think this will be the age of data and AI for the film industry uh, and at each stage of uh, film development, at pre-production, post-production, for casting, uh, uh, financing for, for all states. But then here, there is an important question. Uh, the question you see on the left, we get time to time from producers that, uh, that we contact. Uh, they say, do you want a robot to write and develop my film? Uh, movie industry is very human-centric. It's very uh, creativity-centric. Uh, so there is a fear if the AI is going to take this element away, right? And, and then the question becomes here, AI is coming as a data-driven movie-making tool or data-assisted movie-making tool. At this, from our approach, we designed this as a data-assisted movie-making tool. So the AI doesn't write a script, doesn't produce a movie. Still, it's still human or at the, each part of the de development to, to, to take uh, the project forward. But at all these steps, AI can be a good uh, leveraging tool. Uh, in that regard, we, we think it is like a magnifier. Uh, there's a huge amount of data. It's hard to uh, interpret uh, without using any data tool. And it's hard to benefit from, from this data. So AI helps, uh, helps us to understand the past data. Uh, but also, it, uh, it shows some uh, different aspects about our content. It doesn't change your content, but it shows different aspects about your content that can help you to make it uh, better. But it's also important to understand that it's not a magic stick. Uh, we should also align the expectations from the AI that we see some people think as if you use AI for your film, the things will change like day and night, and uh, you don't need to make any effort. That's not the thing as well. So AI brings some tools. It makes your job easier, but still, as a human, we need to use these tools uh, to be able to advantage uh, of those. OK, so let's go a bit uh, some a bit with the practical examples. Uh, first, I want to give you uh, insights about how the system works. Uh, one fundamental element that our system is doing is to understand the content and create 
some cinematographic ingredients about these contents. It's a map of patterns, uh, but it's like, uh, uh, so here you see some patterns in the middle. I will show you this in a more detail, but AI automatically finds the genre flow of the story, or it creates a DNA uh, of the content with cinematographic attributes, which could be used then for content insights, uh, casting propositions, and market uh, forecast. Uh, so I will show you one example film, uh, Little White Lies Tool, Nofino Ron Ensemble, the French movie. Uh, and let's go step by step and AI analysis over the script of this film. So here the first thing that you see is the genre analysis of the system. The top graph, it shows how each genre is changing over the story from start till the end. Uh, for example, the red color represents comedy, blue is a uh, drama. You can see there is uh, more of drama and comedy patterns, and these peak and valleys, it shows I mean, where these, pa these uh, patterns are increasing, where, are, where they are decreasing. For example, if you see like uh, around section 40, there is a jump of comedy, and then around uh, section 70, there is more of uh, drama. You can have an idea of uh, how, how these patterns are changing over the story rapidly with AI analysis. And then uh, you can compare this uh, with other films. Uh, so the first movie, the, the first movie, this, uh, this is a sequel movie. There, there was a first movie, uh, you might know, Le Petit Mouchoir. Little white lies uh, one. So, for example, we can compare uh, this pattern. Uh, on the bottom, you see the, the example film that we look. Little white lies two. On the top, you see the first uh, film of the sequel. Uh, you can see uh, in this comparison uh, the patterns are looking similar in terms of genre representations, but there is a difference in the frequencies. There is more high frequencies uh, in. Uh, in the Little White Lies uh, 2 example. Uh, so this might mean different things. Uh, for example, if you have more high frequency, that means in general there is more uh, stuff happening. It's a bit uh, uh, higher pace. If it's, if it's good or bad, this we cannot tell it in one film example. But for example, if the, this, uh, uh, these patterns gets very flat, in general, this is associated with very slow uh, pace. In many art house films, it's this way. It doesn't mean anything uh, bad artistically, but it might mean low engagement of the mainstream audience. And here, let's compare, again, our example film with another completely different type of film, and a Hollywood film, Interstellar. Uh, you see interstellar on top, uh, the patterns are, uh, the color of patterns are completely different because it's, this is more sci-fi action film. With the green patterns, it indicates sci-fi elements and the orange patterns, these, uh, these are showing uh, action elements. And we can also see these big peak and valleys which are, uh, which are very much standard Hollywood, uh, Hollywood structure. Uh, sometimes in these patterns we can realize, we can see these uh, 3x, 5x structures, uh, plot points of the, of the content. Uh, yeah, in that manner, these are uh, like a laboratory. There are 60,000 films that have been analyzed on our system. We see producers uh, very often use uh, the previous films to compare with their, uh, with their film to have an idea in terms of structure. Uh, and where the film can go in terms of audience and success. Uh, so I will also connect uh, these examples uh, with some case studies that we have done uh, in the past. Uh, so here uh, we took 80 movies, 80 European movies who used our platform uh, in last uh, six months. Uh, we saw in these genre patterns that I showed you, in the, the dominant genres, the, the genre that was has been mostly exhibited has been uh, drama. Uh, so a, in a big majority of the films, drama has been always a dominant genre. 
and then this has been uh, followed by thriller and uh, comedy. So this actually is showing uh, drama is is really a strongly driven genre uh, in uh, European movies. Although we cannot generalize from eighty to all, but I can tell also in our larger. Uh, uh, case studies, uh, this is the case. One thing important here, we check for these 80 movies, these specific 80 movies, to see how much AI results are agreeing uh, with what producers were thinking about their project. Because once they add uh, their films to, into our system, we also ask them uh, what they think about the dominant genres of their film. Uh, so in majority of cases, AI and uh, producers were agreeing. In only 20% cases, uh, AI and producers were not agreeing for the for the dominant genre. And here you see another analysis from the same film. Uh, in this analysis, AI automatically predicts uh, age suitability of the content for uh, three different groups, adults, all audiences, and teenager plus adults. Again, here, uh, the system shows uh, this for each part of the story. So, for example, at the start, you see a peak of purple, which shows this is more uh, suitable for adults. Uh, the next scene is, is suitable for all audiences. So you can see these kind of, uh, peak and valleys, how, how the content is changing in that manner as well. Uh, but if you look at the summary of this content, it shows that the content is uh, in uh, most of cases for teenager plus uh, adults. It also gives an idea about the targeting of the film, uh, the target audience. Uh, but for this case, uh, there is a big mismatch uh, between what producers are thinking about the age suitability of the content and what AI is thinking. So in 60% of cases, for these 80 specific movies that I mentioned, uh, AI disagreed with the producers as this dominant age suitability, which is very important also for labeling, because of before the films are released, these are the, they are labeled by, the, by local institutions. Uh, and this is, uh, we see the main reason for that uh, uh, majority of the producers for these 80 movies, they have selected all audiences as the suitability, which might be the thing they are targeting as, as eventually you want to target maybe all audiences to increase the potential of the content. But once we look at uh, the reality, this is, not the, this is not the case. For example, if, uh, just to give you uh, an example from US, in US, close to half of the films they are labeled as R, uh, the films that, that, uh, that is suitable for adults. So uh, only a small portion of the film in Europe, a bit uh, higher, but only a small portion of the films are labeled as all audiences. So AI results were more uh, close to reality in terms of distribution of uh, this dominant suitability once we compare with, with the real results. Okay, so and another thing that that system uh, does is this character analysis. Uh, here, the idea is uh, the first at first part. The idea is to find the relationship of the characters. You see in this uh, diagram, the system finds uh, the importance of these characters and also the relationship between the characters. As the circle uh, bigger here, that means the character has uh, more. Uh, uh, weight, more importance in, in, in the story, and the edges between them, if, you, if they are thicker, that means there is more relationship interaction between these two characters inside, uh, inside uh, the story. And this is also important to see uh, because uh, for producers, screenwriters, you can easily see by looking at this graph uh, if a character is overrepresented or underrepresented or if you have, if your protagonist is not strong enough, uh, it's not separating enough uh, from other characters. For example, in this story, you see there is many thick lines, which is normal actually for this type of film. This is an ensemble cast uh, movie, so there are many important characters. It's not just only one single protagonist or protagonist antagonist driven film. 
there are many in, important uh, characters. So in that kind of films, you have uh, much more relationships. And also we can see in the next graph that is uh, found by the system uh, is their appearance in the story. Here, each row represents a different character. You see they appear, all characters are appearing almost everywhere. Uh, again, yeah, this is a type of the structure. Since it's, it is ensemble cast, uh, all characters have this importance, so most of them are appearing uh, everywhere. But if you look at, if you were looking more uh, protagonist, antagonist, uh, driven content, we will see two robes that we have a lot of colors. The other ones will be mostly empty. Uh, and one thing that system is doing, uh, and it's used a lot, is the casting propositions. Uh, so in casting propositions, uh, first, see, uh, firstly, the system creates a DNA of each character in the story. With this DNA, what I mean, uh, some uh, attributes that are relevant to this character. And these attributes, they are predefined. We have 1,000 attributes that are predefined. And these are the attributes that have been mostly associated with the movies in the past by the audience. So system automatically looks the relevance of the character to each of these attributes. And then we get, get a ranking of these, which becomes the DNA of the character. Uh, we do the same thing also for actors uh, by analyzing their previous uh, movies. So we have done this more than 100,000 actor actresses. We have the DNA of these actors as well. And finally, the system looks finds uh, the actors that is having highest this cinematographic DNA match uh, with the character. And here, the first uh, actor you see, François Cruz, this is uh, original cast. Uh, original cast we can put into the system, or the, your own shortlist you can put also into the system to see uh, if the system finds a good match rate. We can see it finds already very high match rates, 95%. And then the other ones, uh, the other ones are some other actors that are uh, proposed by, by the system. And uh, here, maybe yeah, let's look at also the next uh, Marie character. Uh, uh, Marion Cotillard uh, is the original cast here. Again, it has a very high match. And actually, this film is really character driven, and then cast is really really strong. Uh, and that's why, actually, yeah, one reason the first uh, first uh, first of the sequel has worked really, really well. Uh, and also, you see uh, other actors that has been pro actresses that that have been proposed uh, by by the system. And uh, yeah, so here you can check this for all characters, but I just show two uh, two examples for you to have an idea. One last thing to add here, uh, what it means this, uh, if these match scores get, uh, get lower. In our case studies, we have seen if they get low as, they get as low as 60%, uh, you increase the risk of the film in terms of financial success significantly. And this we have seen in many previous films. Uh, Especially both top three actor, top three characters having uh, actor actresses with low match rate. That means you take a big risk. Uh, you try something new. That doesn't mean it's not going to work at all. There is there is cases it's working, but you take a risk. So this is the thing AI is showing. I mean, all these course elements it shows how much risk uh, you are taking. You can sometimes sometimes take the risk, but at least you can take risk in some part and then take not take risk in another element. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a way to visualize uh, all these risk elements. And uh, another thing uh, for the casting proposition, uh, propositions is, uh, is the ethnicity. At this moment, AI is uh, ethnicity blind. We designed it this way. What does it mean? Uh, it means we don't give ethnicity information of actors to the system, so it doesn't learn from the ethnicity. It just looks 
the previous performances, successes of these actors, and in with which attributes they have been more engaged with the audience, from those uh, discourse are built. Uh, so not having ethnicity information, in a way, is a good way to push, uh, to, to go over diversity problems. Um, as we can see, for example, uh, in US case, uh, AI is proposing three times more black actors than what is uh, industry doing uh, regularly since it is uh, ethnicity blind. But at the same time, this is challenged by producers because there are sometimes specific kind of roles that you, let's say you need really uh, a black actor uh, or, or some Asian uh, for this specific actor, uh, then, then yeah, it becomes a problem. Uh, still, AI is considering the active country of these actors uh, in terms of country-wise, but yeah, for ethnicity, we are also a bit uh, questioning this. In one side, there is danger of uh, uh, adding also diversity problem to AI. In other side, we see also there is, if for certain characters, it's important to define the ethnicity uh, of the actors to, to get the right, right, right actor. And uh, one last thing for, for actors, uh, one thing we see uh, is that AI is, in a way, a democratization tool for the movie industry because it opens the doors for, for many people that might be hidden in the corner. Uh, here we had, I mentioned this 80 movies case study. Again, I have a results from that related to actors. We checked uh, the number of different actors that have been proposed by the AI uh, for these eight movies. You see uh, on the ones on the pictures, these, are, these were the ones that have been mostly proposed. Uh, there are actors that have been proposed multiple times for different films. But the important thing, AI has proposed 1,056 different actors for eight movies. Uh, so it doesn't just focus on certain actors and it proposes always the same actors, actresses. Uh, uh, which is also a problem in the industry that makes it difficult for to open the doors for the new uh, talents. Uh, and AI is a way also to, to, to bring certain talents uh, that maybe you would never recognize because there are thousands of actors uh, uh, that it's impossible to, to go over that, but AI sometimes can find some interesting idea in front of your table and then it's, then it's up to you, of course, to use that or not, or to go and search more of that. This is a good example how it becomes a magnifier in that manner. Okay, and another important thing that AI uh, does in our system is this casting, uh, sorry, financial forecast. Uh, it can predict uh, box office, potential box office uh, results of a film really in advance, even at script stage, uh, in a very accurate way. Uh, so much, uh, much better than traditional methods to, to green light the right projects. Here you see an example, AI shows uh, most expected uh, revenue for the film, like on this red line, and then it also shows uh, risk intervals. And you can check this for different countries. Here we have example for France uh, box office, but you can just put the country you want to test, then you will get the results for the corresponding country. And you get this in a very fast way, in a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, and it can also predict, uh, make a predictions for streamings in terms of number of households uh, that would watch, uh, watch the film. Streaming predictions, this is becoming more and more a problem for the industry because for box office, there is some open data. You can go and access the performances of the past past uh, movies, but that's not the case for streaming uh, results. You cannot know how much a film has been watched on Netflix or Amazon. It's a problem, a uh, big problem for the industry at this moment. That's why we had this uh, long-term research uh, ways to, 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 to learn uh, streaming uh, response of the audience for, for films. And then uh, we have developed that, that AI now, uh, again, it's 
very well approximates uh, the potential response uh, to a film on, on streaming platforms. Okay, so one last thing I want to mention uh, from these 80 movies case studies in relation uh, with these uh, financial forecasts. For these 80 movies in this case study, uh, their uh, average budget was 5 million euro. And they had 0 0.9 million average PNA uh, marketing budget. What we did, we checked uh, how much they could improve the forecast of their content in the course that they used AI. Because for AI, you don't just put one-time analysis and you go away. You put analysis, but with the results, you play with your content. You can uh, create different versions, and you also play with your packaging. Because each parameter has, a has an impact on your potential result, like from casting to director, your budget, your release dates, many of these elements. So as producers were playing with this, uh, with these uh, uh, features and then get to run new analysis. We, were, we checked from the worst forecast to best forecasts, uh, how much improvement they could do. So in domestic uh, return on investments with, with AI forecast, they had uh, from first analysis to best analysis, they had a 58% uh, improvement. And for the gross case worldwide uh, revenues, again, they made a 53% improvement for forecasting of these results by, by uh, for finding right uh, set of the parameters uh, for the forecasts. And this is this is one important element also for for uh, for AI. That's the thing I said. It's not a magic stick that you just press the button and then you get uh, everything uh, after that. But you go, you have certain tools, but you really need to put, as the human element still needs to put a lot of effort uh, to use these tools to, to, to leverage the content, to increase uh, the impact of uh, the content. OK, so uh, one thing to mention, I think this is uh, this is my last slide, uh, but I think uh, this is an important slide also to talk about. One thing we try to understand from our AI model, so AI model is, is a black box model. It learns about certain things, but it's always a secret what it has learned. It makes certain predictions, but I mean, what is its judgment? This is always, if you don't search it, it's a mystery. So we looked a bit this part for the financial model, financial forecast model in our AI system for European movies, we checked uh, which parameters has become more, uh, more important uh, for this black box model, which, has, which, of, which of them has more correlation with financial success once it is making its decision. And we saw a budget and p &A have been two most important uh, elements. So this is once again, you can have the best idea, but if you don't have the right budget, uh, it's very difficult to be successful. Right budget doesn't mean big budget. That's very important. So sometimes right budget uh, is a small budget. Here we look at on the, we look on the return on investment. And the other thing is PNA, which is uh, something very problematic in Europe. Uh, p a budgets are uh, very poor, but after you develop a good idea, it's, it becomes always important to put a, a good marketing budget uh, as well, or a correct marketing budget as well, uh, to yes, spread uh, the content uh, to the audience. The content followed by, by, by these two elements. Here, there are more than 1,000 elements, just to, just to tell. Uh, we just look at the most important uh, ones, but the yeah, budget, p and and content becomes the most important ones. Uh, and then this has been the, uh, followed by uh, more like human elements that we have uh, director, uh, distributor, casting, screenwriter uh, that are coming as uh, most important uh, elements. And knowing uh, those, it's, it also gives a bit direction uh, once you work with AI also in general in the content, uh, which, which elements of the 
project development that that we need to put more effort, more uh, more thinking to to develop uh, the right project. And I think that is uh, that is end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sami, for the presentation. It's very interesting indeed. Um, I don't know if you have any question from the audience. Um, just check in if we have questions from the chat. Um, we don't have questions, but uh, I'd love to ask you a couple, a couple of them. So you've been talking about creativity. Obviously, you've been talking about AI. Now, the question is, does AI limit creativity? And can it be, in a way, a threat for the film industry? Yeah, I mean, it's again, uh, it depends how it's how you are using it. With our tools, it's very difficult, I mean, to 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 limit creativity because we design this as an assistance tool. It doesn't tell to you what to do, but it just shows the patterns about what you have created, and then it should be human to look at these patterns and then to decide another thing to go uh, forward. But once AI starts to write scripts, then yeah, we can talk about it starts to limit creativity because it replace, uh, replaces human. And there are these kind of cases, there are some films that has been uh, written by AI. And actually we had a case, we took one AI written uh, movie, we got, them, uh, got this analyzed by our system. So AI written story has, was uh, analyzed by AI. And AI was telling this is not a good film. I mean, uh, for for yeah. AI uh, AI written film, which was uh, which was the case. And in general, I think yeah, for that like for AI written stories, I think there are a lot of uh, roads to go. And then I I also don't think at this I don't see that industry is evolving uh, in that uh, in that direction. And and other aspect here just to add also, uh, so it's important here. It's not like AI is telling this is successful type of the films and then just you follow this kind of uh, ingredients and then go, uh, go with that. So if you start to do that, yes, you can start to also limit uh, creativity in another direction. But again, here, I mean, uh, we also want to design this way so that AI doesn't tell what type, what type of story to create, but it Tell us what is your story about with, with, with other patterns. OK, thank you. So um, and then also in your presentation, we saw some big um, company names, big uh, production names, and then also like uh, some like very, very known like um, actors and actresses. Now, how about the art house cinema or the smaller production companies? Can they also uh, get benefited from the AI as well? Absolutely, I think they can take even more uh, because for for big companies, they many of them they they have the capacity to develop uh, their own AI departments. Uh, it's many people for this is a big challenge for uh, small producers. You cannot create your own technology company. That was also one thing. I mean, uh, we also created a segment just for the small independent producers so that they can get their content analyzed. Uh, and one particular advantage that we see they are using a lot for creating the right packaging and then uh, which helps them to get financed. Uh, because to get your film financing, you should, uh, you should create a good packaging that can convince institutions, uh, investors, and AI is a great tool for that. You don't just go with, uh, with your just gut feeling here, you add also uh, some more scientific element in terms of these forecasts uh, to, to create your, your packaging. Cool, thank you. So then, like, uh, one last question. So who uses AI in the film industry, like, these days, like, currently? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the, the main players, drivers, have been uh, Netflix and Amazon, I mentioned in my presentation. Uh, and then, actually, they showed the industry. <laughs> the importance of uh, data uh, and AI, how, how uh, it can disrupt the industry. Uh, after that, I think studios, yeah, movie studios, uh, they start to become more open. And we know in most of studios, they, are, they start to work both with external companies. They also develop their internal uh, neurotechnology departments. Uh, 
uh, once it comes to independent world, uh, so it is slowly going in that uh, direction. There is much more interest. I mean, from our side here, we get huge uh, interest from independent world, a lot of requests. Uh, so independent world slowly entering to that, uh, that as well. And I believe in a couple of years, uh, especially for production, for producers, uh, uh, the big majority of them, they will uh, use uh, certain AI tools in, in, in the de development process of their film. Cool, excellent. So, yeah, if there are not any more questions, like, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll leave it here. So thanks once again, Sami, for being with us. Um, hopefully next time you'll be here, like next to us, uh, right here on stage. Yeah. But, um, you know, in the meantime, like, you know, thank you very much once again, and it is a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.